Why should we study the Ratzinger Reports, which documents a series of 1985 interviews with Cardinal Ratzinger, the future Pope Benedict XVI? In these interviews, Cardinal Ratzinger discusses the challenges facing the post-Vatican II Church. What can all Christians learn by reflecting on the Ratzinger Report? Should we view Cardinal Ratzinger as a Rottweiler of the Catholic Church, a conservative defending the faith, or were all Vatican II popes actually progressive popes? Does the Vatican II decrees abandon or reaffirm the decrees issued by the Council of Trent? Who is going to influence whom? Will the church influence the culture, or will the culture influence the church? At the end of our talk, we will discuss the sources we use for this video. Please feel free to follow along in the PowerPoint script we uploaded to SlideShare. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. Twenty years after Vatican II, the Catholic Church seemed like a boat adrift without a rudder. Cardinal Ratzinger, who would be later ordained Pope Benedict XVI, expressed his concerns and frustrations with the lack of direction in the Church and the misconceptions of Vatican II in interviews with Vittorio Missori, an Italian journalist who would publish them in the Ratzinger Report. Ratzinger discusses the frustration of men in the hierarchy of the Church on how so few of the faithful both critics and champions of Vatican II actually read and understood the decrees of the Council. Pope John Paul II and Cardinal Ratzinger saw this as a lack of catechesis. So shortly after the 1985 publication of the Ratzinger Report, the Catholic Church started the process to draft a new Catholic catechism, soliciting input from over a dozen cardinals, bishops, and theologians. Ratzinger compared the post-Vatican II Church to a construction site where the blueprint has been lost but everyone continues to build according to his taste. And Cardinal Ratzinger emphasizes these texts and the Catechism convey the wealth and the beauty of the faith. We took care to maintain a balance between witnesses from East and West to truly underline the truly Catholic character of the Catechism. Like Vatican II, the Catechism strives to present the Catholic teachings and traditions to the world, not just Catholics. And since they balance the footnoted teachings on the Eastern and Western Church Fathers, not only can Catholics learn about Catholicism through the Catechism, the Orthodox can learn about Orthodoxy through the Catechism as well. And all Christians can go back to the original sources of Christian tradition, from Scripture in the early first centuries of the Church through the ancient medieval and more modern saints. Gardner Ratzinger told of a note he once received from Hans Balthasar which read, Do not presuppose the faith, but propose it. As Ratzinger teaches, faith is not maintained automatically. Faith is never finished. Faith can never be taken for granted. The life of faith has to be constantly renewed. Genuine faith does not collect dust like plastic flowers. Rather, faith is like flowers of the field who bloom with brilliant colors that turn to face the joy in the life of the sun. Ratzinger continues, faith is not a merely intellectual or merely volitional or merely emotional activity. It is all of these together. Faith is both, I believe, a supremely personal faith, a faith that transcends ourselves, and this faith is also, we believe, we the Church, we the communion of saints, we the Church who worships God and experiences Christ through the sacraments, as the psalmist sings, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, our favorite country song is, you don't love God if you don't love your neighbor. The Cardinal Ratzinger agrees that both are central, and that each of these twofold loves lead to the other. And St. Augustine is my favorite Catholic saint because in every one of his major works, he explicitly iterates this twofold love of God and neighbor. Cardinal Ratzinger pushes back on the common slogan. All that really matters today is orthopraxis or right conduct or love of neighbor. On the other hand, orthodoxy, that is, for right belief, according to the meaning of the scripture, which is read within the living tradition of the church, occupies a second rank when it is not downright alienating. Now this is a facile slogan because it is superficial. Does not orthopraxis, love of neighbor, radically change with the manner and way orthodoxy is understood? Cardinal Ratzinger also insists that we ask, what is the right conduct through which the poor are to be effectively helped in a really Christian manner? Does not the decision for a right behavior presuppose a right thinking? Does it not thereby itself refer to the necessity for a search for orthodoxy? And Ratzinger references the situation in the Third World in Latin America. 
When we were reflecting on the Gaudet et Exaltate Encyclical by Pope Francis on the call to holiness in today's world, we noticed that the 2013 Latin American Conference Aparacita was prominently footnoted, and both Pope Benedict XVI and the future Pope Francis were the leading voices of this conference. Aparacita's message was, do not forget the poor. And Aparacita used a typical expression of the theological and pastoral tradition of Latin America, the preferential option for the poor and marginalized. Aparacita proclaims, Today we want to confirm and promote the option of preferential love for the poor. Concern for the poor is not optional. Pope Benedict summarizes a primary Latin American theological reflection. The preferential option for the poor is implicit in the Christological faith in the God who became poor for us, to enrich us with his poverty. And we want to highlight an observation that Cardinal Ratzinger made about what robbed the spirituality of a particular monastery, which is a really a universal condition in the modern world. He commented on how the ruin of the monastery began when it was declared that rising for the recitation of the prayers of the nocturnal office was no longer practical. What replaced these prayers? The worldly habit of television viewing well into the night. The ruminations in the Ratzinger Report are a continuation of his thoughts in his Milestones memoir, where he also discusses the problems of the historical critical method of biblical interpretation, and his memoirs end with his appointment as Archbishop sometime after the Council. And the Ratzinger Report strived to rediscover the Second Vatican Council. In preparation for the Second Vatican Council, the officials in the Curia and many others in the Episcopate had drafted schemata of the texts for the Council to consider. Formerly repressed reformers such as Yves Congar and Henri de Lubac were part of this committee on the insistence of the Pope, but they had little influence. Cardinal Ratzinger comments that Pope John XXIII had expected that the Second Vatican Council would quickly pass many of these documents, but the Pope also credited the Holy Spirit for the inspiration for calling the Council in his speech opening the sessions. And the Holy Spirit likewise inspired the Council Fathers. They rejected these drafts of the decrees as too theoretical, too textbook-like, and insufficiently pastoral, and not in line with the spirit of the Council as proclaimed by Pope John XXIII in his speech invoking the Council. But Ratzinger adds that none of the changed texts aimed to change doctrine, but rather sought to synthesize, clarify, and develop these texts. Yves Congar and Henri de Lubac and many other theologians, including Ratzinger himself, were influential in drafting these revised decrees of Vatican II. Ratzinger said that Vatican II was right in its desire for a revision of the relations between the Church and the world, but that does not mean that there will never be conflicts. Our journalist then asked Ratzinger if the Church would revert back to its prior opposition to the world, to which Ratzinger responded, it is not Christians who oppose the world, but rather the world which rejects the proclamation of the truth about God. The world which waxes indignant when sin and grace are called by their names. The church must have the courage and capacity to oppose many of the trends of the surrounding culture that distract us from the twofold love of God and neighbor. Cardinal Ratzinger comments that there are conservatives who think that they can support the teachings of Trent in Vatican I and disdain Vatican II, and likewise, there are liberals who think they can support the teachings of Vatican II and disdain Trent and Vatican I, but both of these extreme camps are equally mistaken. Ratzinger notes, there are no leaps in this history. Vatican II did not want to change the faith, but to represent it in a more effective way. The Trent and Vatican Church Councils are on a continuum. They are all part of the Catholic tradition and teachings. You cannot reject one and affirm the other as Vatican II reaffirms the teachings of her preceding councils and quotes extensively from them. Cardinal Ratzinger teaches us, every council that bears fruit must be followed by a wave of holiness. Thus it was after Trent, and it achieved its aim of real reform for this reason. Salvation for the Church comes from within her, not solely from the decrees of the hierarchy. Whether Vatican II and its results will be considered as a luminous period of Church history will depend upon all the Catholics who are called upon to give it life. As Pope John Paul II said in his commemoration of Charles Borromeo in Milan, the Church of today does not need any new reformers. The Church needs new saints. And Bishop Charles Borromeo is mentioned prominently in William O'Malley's history. He made the decrees of the Council of Trent come alive in his diocese in Milan, not by returning to the ethos of the High Middle Ages, but by creating a modern form of the Church. 
And Ratzinger states that Borromeo teaches us how to live according to the traditional values of the church in a new way. And these are some of Ratzinger's other reflections on the Vatican II Council. When asked about the dangers of modern forgetfulness or rejection of the Catholic concept of the church, Cardinal Ratzinger replies, the gravest issue is the decline of the authentic concept of obedience. Some see it not as a Christian virtue, but as a heritage of an authoritarian dogmatic past, which denies the beneficial role of the church hierarchy. This rejects the concept of an authority willed by God, not an authority derived from the consensus of the majority. Cardinal Ratzinger continues, the church is not a party, not an association, and not a club. Her deep and permanent structure is not democratic, but sacramental, consequently hierarchical, based on the apostolic succession from the apostles of Jesus. The church's authority is not based on the majority of votes, it is based on the authority of Christ himself. Cardinal Ratzinger repeats one of the main themes in Yves Congar's books that helped inspire the calling of the Second Council, True and False Reform. In past centuries, saints reformed the church in depth, not by working up plans for new structures, but by reforming themselves. What the church needs in order to respond to the needs of every man in every age is holiness, not management. Cardinal Ratzinger has some wise observations on the sacrament of penance, warning that there are priests who tend to transform confession into a mere conversation, a kind of therapeutic self-analysis between the two persons on the same level. This seems to be much more human, more personal, and more adapted to modern man, but the spiritual danger to this approach is that it can rob the sacrament of its mystery. Ratzinger teaches us that confession must retain the sense of scandal through which a man can say to another man, I absolve you from your sins, drawing authority not from consent of men, but directly from Christ. Motives always matter. Ratzinger concedes that many of the criticisms of the sacrament are valid, that confession is all too often routine, repetitious, external, and anonymous. Indeed, two very necessary sacraments, confession and marriage, are both problematic precisely because they are both so necessary. Confession only works when the penitent truly confesses and strives to improve their habits and attitudes, and are aided when clergy seek to encourage and facilitate a true confession. Now, regarding biblical interpretation, Cardinal Ratzinger discusses both the spiritual benefits and the spiritual dangers of the historical critical method which was developed when Protestants broke the bond between the Bible and the Church. This method interprets the Bible based on a linguistic and archaeological study of the original text using both linguistic and historical methods. Cardinal Ratzinger warns about the dangers of studying the Bible solely as a literary work. The Bible without the Church is no longer the powerfully effective Word of God, but an assemblage of various historical sources from the perspective of the present moment. An exegesis in which the Bible no longer lives and is understood within the living organism of the church becomes archaeology. The dead bury their dead. As Ratzinger notes, the rule of faith, yesterday as today, is not based on discoveries of biblical sources and layers of the Bible just as it is, but as it has been read in the church since the time of the fathers until now. In his later 1994 pontifical biblical commission decree, Cardinal Ratzinger emphasizes his preference for the patristic method of commentary, which studies the writings of the Church Fathers on the scriptures, viewing the historical critical method as a valuable secondary method of interpretation. To Ratzinger, Jesus is best approached with humility on your knees, not as merely your ultimate personal friend. And our video on this decree has an expanded discussion of the historical critical method. Regarding the liturgy, Cardinal Ratzinger teaches us, the liturgy is not a show, a spectacle, requiring brilliant producers and talented actors. The life of the liturgy does not consist in pleasant surprises and attractive ideas, but in solemn repetitions. It cannot be an expression of what is current and transitory, for it expresses the mystery of the holy. The council demanded the faithful be active participants, but this can lead to the spiritual trap of assuming that this can only take the form of activities like speaking, singing, preaching, reading, and shaking hands. But also important is silent, contemplative participation, for silence facilitates a really deep personal participation, allowing us to listen inwardly to the Lord's Word. Cardinal Ratzinger ends his chapter on danger signs with these warnings that the Christian would be remiss toward his brethren if he did not proclaim, the Christ who first and foremost brings redemption from sin, 
if he didn't proclaim the reality of the alienation from God of the fall, and at the same time the reality of the grace that redeems us, that liberates us, if he did not proclaim that to restore us to our original sinless nature, outside help is necessary, if he did not proclaim that the insistence of self-realization and self-salvation does not lead to redemption, but to destruction, if he did not proclaim that in order to be saved we must abandon ourselves to love. And Cardinal Ratzinger also reflects on morals. As Cardinal Ratzinger teaches, a man is like God. A man is capable of love and truth. Moral doctrine begins with the yearning for happiness and love that the Creator has placed in each of our hearts. Love is the heart of morality. When we delve more deeply into this love, we meet Christ, the incarnate love of God. Now, many people are fine with Jesus and the church as long as they do not tell them what to do, particularly when it comes to their love life. In Cardinal Ratzinger's words, these new moral theologians, since we are now adult and liberated, think we ought to seek other behavioral norms by ourselves. This is like the nightmarish theme of the book of Judges, which has the most awful collection of stories in the Old Testament, testifying to a world where all Israel did what was right in their own eyes. As Ratzinger notes, man continually desires only one thing, to be his own creator and his own master. But what awaits us at the end of this road is certainly not paradise. However, once we separate intimacy from marriage, and separate motherhood from marriage, then we are no longer seen as persons, but rather as things, nothing but a product planned according to one's pleasures. Hence, it naturally follows that all forms of sexual gratification are transformed into the rights of the individual, which would include rights to practice homosexuality and to abort unwanted babies, and probably polygamy and polyamory as well. Cardinal Ratzinger views permissiveness as a grave crisis facing the church. He observes, the issue is the rupture between sexuality and marriage. Separated from motherhood, sex has remained without a locus and has lost its point of reference. It is a kind of a drifting mind, a problem, and at the same time an omnipresent power. This causes another rupture. After sexuality and motherhood were separated, sexuality was also separated from procreation. Then the advances of medicine and artificial insemination permitted another rupture, procreation without sexuality. Colonel Ratzinger commented on the status of missions in Africa, noting that though Vatican II introduced necessary changes in its affirmation of religious liberty, no longer treating faith communities in Africa and Asia like colonies, granting local church leaders autonomy, the unintended effect of this decree and the broader decree on ecumenicism did indeed lead to a lessening of missionary zeal. Cardinal Ratzinger observes that hand in hand with the weakening of the necessity of baptism went the overemphasis on the values of the non-Christian religions, which many theologians saw not as extraordinary paths of salvation, but precisely ordinary ones. Ratzinger goes on to observe the slippery path of relativism that many slide down. Many begin to wonder, why should we disturb non-Christians, urging them to accept baptism and faith in Christ, if their religion is their way to salvation and their culture in their part of the world? Ratzinger teaches us that we must guide those who are not saved to the knowledge of the truth. God our Savior desires that all men are to be saved to come to the knowledge that there is one God, and that there is one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for many. And Ratzinger pointed out that the original Jewish apostles who preached the gospel to the Greeks, they too were bringing in the good news from the outside. He observes that the Nazis in Germany were well aware of the foreign nature of Christianity, which is why they tried to obliterate it. Perhaps the analogy St. Augustine gave applies, that maybe you can attain salvation through a roundabout path through the fields and up and down the mountains and the valleys, but salvation is more assured if you instead take the straight and narrow path shown in the gospel. And we'll have some concluding reflections in the Ratzinger Report. Why was Pope Benedict XVI seen by some as the Rottweiler of the Catholic Church? He did silence some liberal theologians when their views diverged too drastically from the official Catholic position. Perhaps Pope Benedict saw himself as the penultimate university theology professor, where the Catholic Church is this giant classroom, where all the faithful are his students, and his job is to correct his students' incorrect notions on the Catholic faith. Which leads to the question, did he go too far at times? And let us conclude with these teachings of Cardinal Ratzinger. More than ever before, the Lord today has made us conscious of the fact that he alone can save his church. The church belongs to Christ, and she depends on him to care for her. 
We are called upon to work with all our might, without anxiety, and with the composure of one who knows that he is a useless servant, even when he has done his full duty. Ratzinger says he has always tried to remain true to Vatican II, to this today of the Church, without any longing for a yesterday irretrievably gone with the wind, and without any impatient thrust to a tomorrow, particularly a tomorrow that includes an imaginary Vatican III that is not ours. And Ratzinger regrets that the authentic reception of Vatican II has not yet begun. Its documents were buried under a pile of superficial or frankly inexact publications. The reading of the letter of the documents will enable us to discover their true spirit. Which is why, in this channel, we like to quote extensively from the sources so you learn more about them and less about our interpretations. Now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. We always find Joseph Ratzinger's books to be very readable, and although he was the one being interviewed, he was quoted so extensively in the Ratzinger Report that he was really a co-author. George Weigel's biography of Pope Benedict XVI includes a history of the Ratzinger Report. To prepare for catechism, the Extraordinary Synod of Bishops was called to Rome to get input on how the Council decrees were being implemented. Vittorio Messori asked to interview Cardinal Ratzinger, and not only did Ratzinger accept, he also was brutally frank. So, consequently, when published, the Ratzinger Report was an immediate sensation, to the degree that one cardinal at a press conference declared, This is not a synod about that book, it's a synod about the Council. Cardinal Ratzinger allowed the Synod Fathers to discuss two questions publicly, whether the Vatican II decrees were misinterpreted, and whether Catholicism was drifting into a type of liberal Protestantism. There were many trends that were worrying the Synod Fathers, which included the loss of a sense of reverence and awe of the Church and its liturgy, where many thought of the Church as a party or a club rather than as a distinctive community of faith and charity formed by the sacrament, a severe decline in the practice of penance or confession, which had too often devolved into another form of therapy. And the Church had lost the sense of the cross. The idea of redemptive suffering found little resonance in the secular West, which was tone deaf to the Church's appeal for a genuine dialogue. I only noticed one sentence in the Ratzinger Report that mentioned abortion. And so back then it wasn't a major issue. And the Ratzinger Report also does not mention the clerical sex scandal that has since nearly engulfed the Church. We also use Cardinal Ratzinger's book on Gospel Catechesis and Catechism as a source. We also have a book review video on our sources for our videos on the history and decrees of Vatican II. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the Meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.